The gospel is always good news, and it's easy for us to see that tonight. This gospel is just chock full of good news from, from start to finish. Uh, first of all, it's important to notice in this gospel, Jesus takes the first step. It's called the divine initiative. He initiates. The two disciples are following after him at a distance. Why? I don't know. Maybe they were shy, or maybe they, they thought it was impolite to, to, to go up to him. Anyway, for whatever reason, they're following at a distance. So Jesus stops and turns around and says, what are you looking for? In other words, Jesus takes the first step. He asks the question to draw them into him. He meets them more than halfway. That's true for all of us. Our God always takes the first step. St. Augustine put it this way. He said, we could not even begin to search for God unless he had already found us. Anybody who says, I'd like to get closer to God is saying, God's already found me. I love that uh, Revelation uh, 3.20. You've seen the picture with Jesus standing at the door. In Revelation 3.20, says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens the door, I will enter and sit and have supper with him. In other words, he's always seeking us out. He's always knocking on the door of our hearts. All we have to do is open the door and let him in. The first step is always his. Uh, when you think, you know, I should pray more, or uh, I should call uh, a friend of mine or a family member who I know is lonely, or wh whatever, anything that comes, that's step two. Step one was Jesus giving you that inspiration, that invitation in the first place. The first step is always his. Then Jesus asks him this wonderful question, what are you looking for? In other words, what are the deepest desires of your heart? What is the basic direction of your life? It's a wonderful question for us to ask ourselves often. Um, what am I looking for? What am I really trying to get out of my life? Some are looking for security, enough money to meet life's needs, enough money for retirement. Nothing wrong with that. But that will not be enough of a goal toward which to direct our whole life. That won't, be, that won't do it for us. Some are searching for a career, for power, prestige, opportunity to use their talents to serve other people. Again, nothing wrong with that. But again, that, that horizon is going to be limited by this world. When I die, that, that doesn't carry over. Some are searching for peace, to be at peace with themselves, to be at peace with God, to be at peace with their neighbor. That's a search for God. And that goal only Jesus Christ can meet for us. I, I was thinking this week of an analogy. I think all of our life is like a layered cake. So we explore the top layer, and it's good. Cake's good, but it's not enough. So we go to the next layer. In other words, the next goal for our life, whatever is our next thing. And that's very good, but it's not enough. And we go through layer after layer after layer. And as we do, God is purifying our hearts. He's gradually showing us, yeah, those are all fine, but they're not going to do it for you. You're going to need more. You're going to need me. Hopefully we find that out way before our deathbed. Our God keeps it, keeps it going deeper and deeper till ultimately we realize my desire and the last, last point is for God. My heart is made for God and that's what I want. We don't believe that Jesus would give us those desires to love God, to have that personal relationship with him, and then not fulfill him. Our God is not a trickster God. He doesn't give us a desire in our heart and then say, sorry, you can't have it. Holy desires always come from God. And our Lord is there to help us fulfill those holy desires with our life. And then he says to them, they say, where do you live? And he says to them, come and see. He's not inviting them to check out his interior decoration skills, right? What he's saying is, come and find the things that only I can open up to you. Come and learn, Jesus is saying, from my goodness and wisdom and love. And they stay all day with him. How can you and I come and see? How can we come to God and see our Lord? I think an excellent way is prayer. 
uh, just a daily quiet time with our Lord. Adoration Chapel is wonderful for that. When driving in the car, just sitting in a quiet area of your home, maybe before the household wakes up. Those are all great ways to come and see God, just to open our hearts and let him speak to us. Scripture is a wonderful way. We believe scripture is the inspired word of God and it's a personal word to each one of us. So if you're reading Gospel of Mark, if you're reading Colossians, nice and slow, there's gonna be a personal word just for you in that reading. It's a great way to come and see God. The sacraments, especially the Eucharist, where we receive Jesus into our bodies and then we go back to our pew and that's the time to tell Jesus the most deep and intimate and important prayers in our heart. Jesus is living literally inside our body. That's the most precious prayer time of the whole week. We get back to the pew after receiving Holy Communion. A wonderful way to come and see our Lord. Serving the poor uh, opens our hearts and lets God speak to us in a way that he probably normally can't get through. Uh, the teachings of the church, of the saints, reading a spiritual reading book, reading even the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's so clear. Our world is so messed up today with all these stupid um, issues. So you go to the Catechism, look up any of those stupid issues, and they're right there in the Catechism. And the teaching of the church is so simple and direct and clear. It's a great way to come and see God. Obviously, just spending time with Him. He's our best friend. Those are all ways that you and I can come and see God. And Bishop Barron talks about this a lot. Once we see, then we go. That's the biblical norm. So Moses sees the burning bush, and then he goes and leads the people out of slavery into the promised land. Paul sees a blinding light, falls down, and then once he sees, he goes and turns from being a hater of Christians to being a great apostle. You and I too, once we see, once we know God, then we're called to go and tell others who are desperate to hear that message. I um, was thinking the other day, uh, we are blessed to have five men from our parish in the seminary right now. That's one of them right over there, Ryan Newray. Isn't it great to see him, huh? Let's give him a little encouragement. And all five of them, over the years, have told me, uh, you know, my senior people have said to me, did you ever think of being a priest? So those people were inviting those five young men to consider a vocation to the priesthood. They saw in those five men something holy and good and solid, and they invited them into the priesthood. I think we do better maybe at telling that to young men who might be a, a priestly candidate than we do with the man on the street. How are we at inviting others to faith in God, to our Catholic faith? One of the great nurses in our parish recently told me, she works in a hospital, and she said an elderly gentleman came into the hospital and somehow they just got in this great conversation. It's kind of a no holds barred very tender conversation. At one point she said to him, did you ever think about becoming Catholic? And he said, you know, I did but no one has ever asked me. And she said, well, I'm asking you right now. And he became a Catholic before he died. No one has ever asked me. In a way, that's kind of an indictment of you and I. We see, we see that God is the answer. We see that Jesus loves us. Once we see, we go. Once we see, we are called to go out and tell others about Jesus Christ and invite them into our wonderful faith. Once we see, we go.